Hi everyone, and welcome to this new session of the research seminar series hosted by Nomadic Labs. It's an honor for me to introduce today's speaker, Manuel Hermene Rildo. He's a world-class star of static analysis and abstract interpretation, and I've known his name since I started working in this field. Manuel is a distinguished in professor at the IMDEA Software Institute and a full professor at UPM, the Polytechnic University of Madrid. Today, he will talk about the work of his team on a tool for static analysis, verification and optimization of the resources consumed by Michelson contracts on the Tezos platform. Please feel free to ask questions directly on the chat. A Q&A will happen at the end of the presentation. Manuel, the stage is yours. For inviting me to give a talk in the seminar. This is joint work with Pedro, Jose, Victor and myself done at the IMDEA Software Institute, UPM and CSIC. And the idea is to report on the objectives and our progress in developing a tool for the analysis and verification of the resource consumption of Tezos contracts. We start with some motivation. Knowing beforehand the cost of running a contract in terms of computation time, increases in storage size, etc., can be very useful for users. For example, it can allow us to know how much we will be charged for completing the transactions, and it can also allow us to know whether the gas limits will be exceeded and does avoid being charged for transactions that are not complete due to gas. Now, we can do testing and simulation on the platform, but of course, this will only prove whether a particular input or set of inputs meets or doesn't meet the specification. Even if we try many cases and everything is fine, still for some other cases, consumption could grow dramatically and we may never be able to find out until it's too late. So in that sense, what we would like is to have a way to obtain guaranteed bounds statically, i.e. without having to execute the contract, or perhaps through some combination of static and dynamic methods. As we know, only formal methods such as abstract interpretation or other proof methods can give us proof that a program does comply with specifications for a set of possible inputs that in general can be infinite or unpredictable. So we will do just that. We will try, in particular, abstract interpretation. Let's have a look closer look now at the idea of resource analysis. The objective of resource analysis is to statically and automatically infer and verify upper and lower bounds on the usage that a program makes of resources. These can be execution steps, data sizes, times, memory, those are the classic ones. But we're also interested in user-oriented um, uh, and application-oriented resources like bits sent over the internet or received over a socket uh, SMSs, database accesses, procedure calls, files left open, money and gas spent. Also, these are dif different resources can have different characteristics. For example, they can be platform dependent or platform independent. They can be cumulative or non-cumulative. Uh, we could be interested in inferring actual bounds with concrete constants or asymptotic bounds. Applications in practice often use the actual bounds or need the actual bounds. In addition, Inferring resource consumption has many applications. For example, performance debugging, performance verification, certification of performance, security, absence of side channels, um, identification of finding uh, target, uh, attack targets uh, for these side channels, uh, resource-oriented optimization, resource-driven optimization, granularity control in parallelism, which was actually our first motivation for all these resources work. And of course, uh, contract gas. Quite a bit of progress has been made in the area since the first work of Vecbrite. Uh, we also developed the first complete analyzers in the 90s. I have put some more references uh, down here. But there's also a lot of recent exciting uh, work, uh, which has occurred, which I, some of which I have also referred there. Some characteristics and challenges of resource analysis. This is a simple program, a filter written in C. The most important elements here are the input variable element, which is an integer, and the loop that iterates for this number of um, elements and then is followed by some if analysis. Now, the key issue here is that the cost of these programs depends on the value of elements, i.e. This cost is not characterized by a single concrete number, but instead what we want to do is infer a function, i.e. What is the cost as a function of some characteristics of the input of this program. That is, this, this characteristics of the input is what we call the metric, and it's used to measure the size of the inputs. 
In this case, the key is the size of elements, which is in this case an integer, but it could be an array or a list or anything else. The inference of functions as opposed to, to values is one um, difference with classical worst case execution time analysis and, and related methods. Now, of course, this sort of resource consumption analysis is undecidable in general. So we have to resort to approximations. And of course, we prefer uh, safe approximations. So that our objective is going to be to infer upper and lower bounds and to do that as accurately as possible. So what is the solution for that? Um, we will use abstract interpretation, of course. So if we do the analysis of this program, what we want to obtain is um, a pragma like this one, a pragma that um, this um, green one here, which is a true assertion and tells that the energy consumption is between this lower bound and this upper bound, which in this case are both functions, linear functions. And these functions essentially define two curves uh, so that our energy consumption is guaranteed to be between those two curves. This information allows us to verify assertions also. Assume we have an assertion like the blue one, a check assertions. This is providing a specification that the energy consumption has to be within this limit. For example, uh, in nanojoules, this 416. Um, also, we're saying here that we're only interested in positive values of uh, elements. Then we can compare that against the inferred information, which we had like before, right? And then we can get results like these green and red output assertions where the system has proven that for a certain interval of input values, of values of elements in particular between 1 and 120, the assertion, the specification has been proved correct, i.e. is checked for these values. And from some other values, in this case, um, greater or equal to 121, it is false. And in fact, in general, there could also be ranges where the tool cannot say the specification is true or false. With all this in mind, we can set our objectives and, and our plan. What we would like to develop is a flexible tool for static analysis and verification, as well as optimization of resources for Tezos. A tool that allows us to establish bounds statically and safely on the resource uses of contracts, and so that those bounds are functions of input data sizes. We wanted also to deal with a wide range of resources, execution storage, basic resources, number of allocations, stop, steps, bytes read, bytes written, operations, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to deal with changes in the protocol, in changes in gas costs, et cetera. Of course, we wanted to support Mikkelson, but also possibly other contract languages. And we want to be able to use the inferred information for verifying statically that, for example, GATS limit limits are not exceeded as well as performing optimizations, et cetera. And all of this while maintaining relevance to users, of course, and providing additional tooling in support of the notion of verified infra infrastructure that is one of the key advantages of Teso systems. And we consider that uh, this system would be a contribution to that, towards that. We start by describing the approach that we use to solve this problem, which we call the parametric resource analysis approach. The main idea here is that rather than developing analysis for each resource and each language, we make resources and input languages parameters of the approach. Thus, different languages are supported via a translation to an intermediate representation, which in our particular case is horn clause logic. Different resources are supported by defining the consumption of individual operations by means of an assertion language. And this is what we call the cost model. Let us first look at how we define cost models. As mentioned before, in our approach, the programmer defines the resource consumption of the basic elements, i.e. the instructions, the bytecodes, the libraries, the basic operations of the language. And this is what we call the cost model. Then, based on this, the system infers the resource bound functions for the rest of the program by integrating the cost of the primitives. And for us, these resource bound functions take the form of call pattern research uses function, function pairs for each program point. Thus, for a certain call, and in fact, a certain path, we get a certain cost function. Now, the specification 
of uh, the consumption of the basic elements is done by the means of these assertions that describe the cost of each individual instruction. Thus, for a given operation and a particular cost state, we provide the cost by first providing the type of approximation that we're giving. So if it's an upper bound and a lower bound, etc., then the name of the resource that we're talking about, and finally, the expression, a function that describes this cost. These functions can be linear, they can be exponential, logarithmic, and so on, with constants, and they're functions of the sizes of the input arguments to that operation. So here you see, for example, um, a, a simple operation appending two lists, where we can see that the cost of append for the resource steps that we are defining here above depends on the length of the input list x, and the cost function is actually length of x plus 1. For example, for this simple functional naive reverse program, also for the resource step, which we have defined here, uh, defined here at the beginning again, we infer statements like these ones below. These are marked as true assertions because they have been inferred, i.e. they reflect information that has been proved correct by the analyzer. These um, statements talk about number of steps, like we said, but which uh, is the resource that we have defined. And they're saying that, for example, the append one function will execute exactly the number of steps that is the length L of the input list X. So it's the length L of the input list X. And they're also saying that reverse is quadratic, which we know is correct for night reverse, of course. And in fact, exactly half L squared plus three halves of L plus one, where L is again the length of the input list this time to reverse. Furthermore, we also infer the sizes of arguments because these are instrumental to be able to estimate the cost of the following steps in the program that may receive the results of reverse. Since in every part of the program, the cost depends on the size of inputs, you need to have the outputs from the previous steps in order for the rest of the program to compute the cost. But thus, it's very important to infer these output sizes. So here in this case, we're inferring that the output from, from reverse is y, and it is a list, and also that the length of this list is the same as the length of um, the input list x. Or, for example, we're also um, inferring that the output from append 1 is a list that is one element longer than the input list. This is a table that provides some examples of uh, the types of resources that can be defined. You see them here with our parametric resources approach. Um, including assertions and deletions, disk movements, arithmetic operations, bytes read or written, and so on, and for a variety of programs. You can also see that the cost functions inferred by the systems can be linear, quadratic, polynomial, exponential, uh, a, a great variety. These are some other examples from Java program obtained by analyzing the bytecode. And again, we can see many application-oriented resources such as bandwidth required, SMSs, uh, monetary cost, energy consumption. Um, and then again, we see different cost functions, resources, uh, size metrics, types of loops, and, and so on. Now, as mentioned before, an important characteristic of the system is that we support different languages and compilation levels. And this is done by program transformation into this intermediate representation in horn clause logic. This process is related to the notion of abstract compilation. The input to this pro uh, process is the program P in the source language, LP, and the semantics of this language P, which can be given, for example, by an interpreter written in the target language, which in this case is a horn clauses. So it would be an interpreter written in that language. Our objective is to obtain a set of horn clauses that captures the semantics of the original program, possibly abstracted. Home crosses are used uh, widely nowadays as intermediate representation in formal tools. Now, the result that we get out of this operation depends a bit on how the semantics is described, if it's a big step semantics, a small step semantics, etc. Using a big step semantics, the result is typically that each horn clause captures each basic uh, block of the original program, 
and that they are connected according to the program uh, control flow graph. We will see that in some exa examples afterwards. Now, this process can be realized by partial evaluation of the semantics of the input program, i.e. of the interpreter, or with, with respect to a given program, or we can build a compiler either automatically or by hand, which would correspond to a Futamura projection. The, it's interesting to point out that this approach the, the, with the intermediate regression is used for all the analysis that we will see later, class hierarchy analysis, shapes, types, data sizes, and but of course for the resources. This is a very simple example. Uh, here we take as input an um, S-Core binary um, assembler program, which has been compiled from, from the C source. The process uh, first extracts the blocks and the connections between the blocks, then represents the blocks as horn clauses, as you can see here. For example, the two branches of the conditional here Red and green are encoded by two clauses of the same predicate BFO1 that we see here. Then these clauses are combined with the cost model, which is a set of assertions, as you can see here. Um, recall from the reverse example that these assertions describe the primitives. And in this case, we provide the descriptions of the machine instructions that compose uh, the, the, the machine language. And for each of those instructions, we give upper and lower bounds which in this case is for energy consumption, as you can see here. These are the real en energy val values, uh, checks against hardware and so on. This is a very simple uh, model with constants, but I mean, we could have much uh, more complicated uh, models with functions for the upper bounds and the lower bounds, uh, et cetera. With this, we finish with the first part, with the review of the parametric resource analysis approach, and we can tackle the second part, um, the, the, uh, developing our analyzer for Mikkelson contracts. So our source will be a Mikkelson program or some higher level source that has been compiled to Mikkelson, and the output of our tool will be the gas and storage consumption bounds for entry points and internal blocks as functions of the entry parameters of the contract. Now, in order to construct this tool, we'll follow the approach. First, we will develop an interpreter for Mikkelson. And for this, we will transliterate directly the semantics of the instruction definitions in the Mikkelson specification into horn clause logic. Then we will develop a compiler of Mikkelson into our constraint horn clause uh, intermediate representation based on a partial evaluation of the semantics. Of course, we will also need to develop a gas model for the Mikkelson instructions, and of course, feed all that to our analyzer infrastructure. We start with a quick review of the Mikkelson language. This is, of course, all well known by this audience, but please bear with me so that I can get to the part uh, about the semantics. As we know, uh, Mikkelson is interpreted, strongly typed, and stack-based. Despite being somewhat low level, it still uses some high level data structures like lists, sets, maps, begins, and, and others. As we know, a Mikkelson contract has three sections. We can see here an example from a simple reverse. The first section is the parameter section, which gives us the type of the input argument. The next one is the storage section, which gives us the type of the storage. And the third one is the code section, which has the sequence of instructions to be executed by the Mikkelson interpreter. Then the interpreter is a pure function that receives a stack and returns another stack without altering its environment. The input stack basically contains only a pair parameter storage, which is the initial value of the parameter and the initial value, of course, of the storage. And then the output stack is also basically a pair that has a list of blockchain operations on one hand, and the new storage produced after the execution of the contract on the other. The Mikkelson instructions can also be seen as pure functions that receive an input stack and return a result stack. This table shows the semantics of the Mikkelson instructions 
used in the previous example of reversing the list. We see, for example, that nil inserts an empty list on top of the stack. We have to provide the type of the elements that we'll be pushing. Swap exchanges uh, the top two elements of the stack. And as an example of a more complex instruction, iter traverses the element of a list, performing an action indicated by its arguments, which can be a macro or a sequence of instructions. There are other instructions that receive code as an argument. For example, control structures in the language, uh, such as ifs and loops. These are instructions that receive one or two blocks of code. Other instructions receive other uh, kinds of arguments, such as nil, which receives the type of the list to be built, or push, which receives the type of the value of the element to be placed on the stack. As a concrete example of the operation of the interpreter, a call to the previous contract with a list of numbers from one to three as parameter would present the following input and output stacks, as you see here. Note that since the first instruction car in the contract discards the storage, the value of the storage at the beginning of the execution doesn't matter or affect at all the result of the computation. Our first step then is to translate Mikkelson programs into the intermediate representation in logic as constraint hold clauses. For this, we will have to provide the Mikkelson language semantics expressed in the target language, i.e. in horn clauses. Here, we see uh, the same table as before, defining some Mikkelson instructions. And in the table below, we have the equivalent representation as Herbrand terms and clauses in the horn clause logic representation. Looking, for example, at the swap instruction here and here, we can see that the input stack and the output stack are represented by lists. And we can also see how the element in the first stack um, are, are um, swapped in the second list. You can also see how the car instruction in the first element is taken from the stack um, and also the iter instruction, which is implemented through a recursive rule in the horn clauses. Confidence in the logic representation is given by the direct correspondence with the definition of the semantics of the instructions above. Our next task is to develop the also semantic based Mikkelson to horn clause translation. To this end, we implement the Mikkelson semantics as a big step recursive interpreter in the horn clauses, where, as we saw before, the data structures are represented with Herbrand terms. Here you can see a sketch of the interpreter. Run takes the input program and the initial stack and reduces it by executing the sequence of Mikkelson instructions to obtain the resulting stack. And then ins is the instruction dispatcher, which connects its instruction term i with its HC definition as a predicate of name i, which is given in the previous table. So this constitutes an interpreter in logic of the specification of the Mikkelson semantics. Our next step is to derive from this interpreter a compiler that, given a Mikkelson program, derives an uninterpreted home cross representation of its semantics that we can analyze. To this end, as preliminary transformations, we will introduce label blocks for sequences of instructions in the program to help in later uh, steps in the partial evaluation. And we consider them simply as new predicate definitions. We also rely on a simple implementation within the system of the Mikkelson type checker, which allows knowing the type of stack that we have um, at each program point. This makes it possible to specialize the polymorphic instructions depending on the type of the past arguments. And it's particularly useful to specify, as we will see later, the semantics and cost of each instruction variant, which can depend on those static types. This can be seen in this instruction, which is translated into one of seven primitives operations, depending on the type of the operands as marked there. Now, based on our interpreter, we derive a, a simple translator, which combines a handwritten specializer for the run three predicate with a stack deforestation pass. The stack deforestation includes each stack elements access instead of the stack itself as predicate arguments. It turns uh, parts of the stack into arguments of the predicates. We then apply a generic partial evaluation pass to the primitive structure definitions. For example, 
We partially evaluate conditions, as seen here, and we do the same with arithmetic instructions and other operations. The Michelson control flow instructions receive both the control condition and the code to execute as inputs. The code arguments are bound to new constants representing code blocks and are dispatched from ints, uh, as seen before. For each call, partial evaluation will unfold the if instruction and generate new instances, as we can see in the example. Then the stack deforestation step, which is illustrated here, is especially useful in the output of control flow instructions. We receive an argument for each element in the input and the output stack, uh, as we can see here. This transformation is possible thanks to the Michelson sem semantics, which forbids changes to the type of the stack in loops and forces the type of both output stacks in branch instructions to match. Now we encode an extension of the instruction definitions that um, we call cost markers. The idea of these cost mar markers is to allow aggressive program transformation while preserving the actual cost of the instructions. Parcel evaluation will replace each of the primitive operation by its home cost definition, but the cost markers will be preserved to keep a record of the consumed resources at each step. We can see marker here, several markers, uh, preceded by the dollar signs. As a result of the transformation, some Michelson instructions that simply modify the stack will not even be represented. They disappear in the transform program, and only their uh, cost uh, markers will be left behind where relevant. So we see here that the operation, the swap operation is performed there, but we leave the marker so that we can count a swap operation. As a simple example, here on the left, you can see a, a simple Michelson contract that performs some arithmetic operations. And on the right, you can see the constrained horn clause representation. Here you can see clearly that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the instructions in the Michelson contract and the literals in the, in the horn clause uh, representation. Some operations such as mool or add and so on are implemented by their definitions in the logic while the cost of others like dupe or car are encoded through the cost markers. This is another example, reverse. And here uh, on the left, you can see the same uh, reverse example that we saw before. And on the right, the horn close encoding, we can see that some operations and as cons are again defined by, um, as cons here. They're again defined by um, their definitions, while others are left with their, their markers. We can also see that the iter operation is translated into a recursive predicate. Now, once that we have established the translation into the intermediate form, the next stage in our approach is to encode the Michelson cost model. There are several ways to obtain this model. We can use um, the already defined cost model uh, provided by the, by the platform, or we can extract it from the source code of the platform by program analysis, uh, slicing, for example, using a static analysis tool, or we can even do manual extraction. In fact, this is how we started uh, through a manual extraction uh, because um, at the beginning there wasn't much um, independent information, but uh, now Tesos provides uh, much more specific information in this, in this regard. Now, the Tesos gas uh, computation model, which we need to represent, has <clears throat> several components. In terms of the analyzer, uh, this is what we call a compound resource. Our cost model must be able to express gas as a function that depends on a number of basic resources, because it's a derived um, resource. In particular, gas depends on allocations, steps, reads, writes, bytes read, bytes read, bytes written. This is, for example, this expression for the Carthage uh, model will be this one. And here we can see these models expressed with Chow assertions. As you can see, it's a compound resource that is defined and is given by individual resources and with the formula. And they're given for two models, two Tesla's models, uh, Carthage and Delphi. As you can see, the assertions that constitute the model are just a transliteration of the platform model as it is defined. 
Another thing that is important in the cost model definition is to find other details like the sizes of the output in terms of the input for every operation. So you see it here that we're providing these definitions. Now, once we have a cost model and the representation of the contract in constrained horn clauses, then we can apply our analysis. And th that is uh, composed of not just the resource analysis, but uh, also all the other analysis um, that it requires that are shown here in the figure. And the expected output will be the data and storage sizes and resource usage functions as we, as we um, mentioned before. Now, going back to the reverse example that we have here, these are the analysis results as produced by our prototype tool. A correct upper bound is inferred for the size of the uh, output argument D, uh, stating that it's a list of the same length as the um, input parameter A, you see, you see here. We can also see that the gas consumption is linear and proportional to the size of the of the input list here the a here and we can also see the difference in the in the storage here we go back to the arithmetic example and uh, this is the information produced by the analyzer uh, a correct bound is inferred for the size of the output argument and also thanks uh, to the cost model we also get an upper bound on gas um, but as you can see, it's built from several components. Note, for example, that the total gas is not a constant. I mean, even though it's an arithmetic uh, program. Um, in fact, it's an expression that includes the log A squared plus two times B. You can see those expressions uh, here for, uh, for gas and with several components. This is due to the fact that in this model, arithmetic instructions do not have a constant cost. So in fact, the cost is a, a, a function of the parameter and the storage, as you can see here. The initial, so here A is the parameter, the initial parameter and um, the parameter, and here uh, B is the, the initial storage. Now, a good question is how are these functions inferred? All right, so let's see how the uh, static resource analysis works. The first step is that we have to do a lot of other analysis, so a lot of supporting analysis. We have already mentioned the type inference, which is generalized here to a size type analysis and general a shape analysis. This is necessary for this uh, determining the size metrics, i.e. how you can measure the relevant sizes of your data structures. Depending on the language, you may also have to do some kind of sharing or aliasing analysis if we have pointers for correctness uh, to ensure that you don't have aliasing or if you have it to deal with it. Sometimes we may need to do an exception analysis, which um, is typically necessary if you want to infer non-trivial lower bounds so that we can ensure the execution will not stop prematurely and thus we will not reach the lower bound. It would not compute for the promised number of steps. And uh, for all these analyses, we use our standard abstract interpreter, PLY, which is modular, context and path sensitive, incremental, etc. <clears throat> and this is a very interesting topic, how all this works. But of course, it goes uh, outside the, into details that are beyond the, our topic here. Now, once we have all the information from this analysis, we can set up recurrence equations. We set these equations first on the data sizes, i equations for the size of each relevant output argument as a function of the input data sizes. Now, the metrics used to determine these data sizes are derived, as I mentioned before, from the inferred type or shape information. And this allows us to build data dependency graphs that determine the relative sizes of uh, the contents of variables. And with that, we compute solutions to these recursive equations on data sizes by bounding them. And depending on whether we're doing upper uh, or lower bounds, we obtain um, output sizes of procedure calls or buildings, et cetera, as functions of input argument sizes. Um, and these are solved you know, with the recurrent solver or with other uh, techniques. And um, for those we can use the, you know, for the solving, we can use our internal recurrent solver. And we can also use um, interfaces that we have with Mathematica, Parma, Pulse, and other computer algebra systems. We also use other techniques such as a ranking function and sometimes polynomial techniques. 
The solution to these equations on data sources look like this. So here we have a system. We have that the system has inferred um, that the size of the list that is produced by CONCAT is the sum of the sizes of the input lists. Then, um, as the next step, you know, after we got the, the, the sizes, we use the size functions to set up recurrence equations representing the computational cost of each resource in each block of the program. And we compute, uh, following a similar technique, again, bounds for the solutions uh, uh, for these equations. And with that, we obtain the resource usage functions as functions such as these that we saw uh, in the example. This was the example for an reverse. Here we have results from some simple contracts. Uh, this table shows some analysis results for some test programs uh, using different Mikkelson data structures and con flow, control flow instructions, uh, as well as different cost functions on different metrics. And you see the metrics um, um, here, and here, and here you see the the, the functions. Um, here, alpha is the size of the parameter, and beta in these expressions is the size of the initial storage again. We are only showing here orders uh, of complexity for simplicity, <clears throat> but of course the, um, the, the system infers uh, constant also. They, they are just here meant to show what kinds of uh, functions we're getting and that we're also doing it in reasonable time. Here's um, another set of, um, of results also. So far, we have described the process of building our first prototype and a number of improvements on it. Other recent progress includes, for example, in the cost analyzer, several additions to the translation to horn clauses. Uh, we have also been encoding the new cost models that have been appearing after Carthage and Delphi, i.e. Edo, Florence, Granada, and now Hansu and um, Ithaca. And we have introduced in the translation support for Mikkelson entry points, which we, I will uh, talk about a bit later. We have also designed and implemented some candidates for assertion language at different levels, um, starting from the Mikkelson level, also at the analyzer level, and also for the uh, source level. This is uh, a bit experimental still. So regarding the issue of entry points that I mentioned, this is an example that has several entry points, uh, map, cons, reverse, and default. Um, now, entry points are now supported in the transformation, and this is done through a program specialization during the partial evaluation. This uh, program specialization uh, uh, makes different predicates be generated in the horn clause representation of the contract, one for each of the entry points of the Mikkelson contract. And therefore, they can be analyzed um, separately. Here we see the predicate for the cons entry point. And then here, the separate predicate for the map entry point. Note, by the way, that there's a lam lambda zero predicate here that is the resultant of the partial evaluation for the lambda, lambda being passed. Uh, for which we do not have a priori an implementation for it. Then uh, here uh, we have the reverse entry point and the implementation for reverse, and here the implementation for, for the default. And here we see some snippets of the analysis output um, and with results for cons, which is uh, constant, um, and fixed gas and storage uh, costs, and for reverse that has a linear um, as you can see here, it has a linear um, gas consumption. However, for MAP, the system cannot infer an upper and lower bound since it has no information about what argument is um, on the argument, I mean, on the characteristics of the argument that is passed to MAP. And that is an example where using assertions um, can help improve the precision of the analysis. For example, here, we have a trust assertion that provides cost information for the input lambda. Uh, here we're saying we're giving a constant uh, for, for that, but it could be a function. It could be a function of parameters. And this is the same mechanism used to define the cost functions of the built-ins in the cost model. So we're using trust 
assertion is just the same. Uh, this is one of the formulas that we have implemented with the usual technique of embedding the native assertions of the analyzer as, as comments, as you can see here. But we have also proposed other more Mickelson native formats for assertions. And like I mentioned before, it's a very interesting topic and we'll be interested actually in collaborations uh, for defining common assertion languages with other um, members of the community that are uh, working on, on this topic. With this, the system can actually now infer a linear bound for, um, for the, the contract uh, for the map entry point based on the constant uh, cost given before, which affects each call of the Lambda call. And the combination of the calls gives us this linear, linear um, bound here. To conclude, I would like to mention some of the challenges that we're addressing currently, as well as some plans. We are working, of course, on broadening the classes of contracts for which we can get precise results. To this end, we're working on using size types analysis to improve precision in contracts with complex types. We're improving the recurrence equation solver, which is, um, in fact, improving the cost analysis. We are also uh, incorporating better support for variable sized integers, and we are extending the support for a higher order uh, of course, for, to support the Mikkelson lambdas. Now, as for inferring new properties, we're adding the inference of the size and shape of the list of operations, which was uh, not implemented before. And we're also working on connecting with the verification functionality of the, of the framework, uh, which of course involves the assertion language. So we can uh, verify assertions and falsify assertions, et cetera, find static um, gas bu bugs. Now, as more medium-term challenges, we would like to apply the framework to detecting cost-related vulnerabilities. We'd like to study the possibility of incorporating runtime checks. We're also considering analyzing contracts um, that interact, uh, their interaction be between contracts, where we believe that um, the notion of accumulated costs that we have developed and, um, and it's also related to uh, higher order, so these, both of these things can be useful. And in any case, uh, more generally, we're working on evolving the prototype as much as possible into an interactive tool uh, that uh, could possibly support different uh, contract languages in addition to Mikkelson. For example, SmartPy or Lego or Indigo, EDSL, Archetype, um, etc. I don't want to finish without uh, mentioning, of course, the whole team. I mentioned the co-authors at the beginning, but here you see uh, all the team members at India that has contributed uh, to this work and also some previous uh, members. And um, and with, with that, I conclude. Um, we would like to thank Mehdi Vaziz, Vincent Poulpol, Rafael Codelier, Guillaume Beau, Jan Regis Janas, um, Michel Moni, Bruno Bernardo, and other members of the Nomadic Labs uh, for their interactions and feedback. And I thank you for listening, and we're happy to take questions. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for your presentation. And let's have a look at the question in the chat. There's no question for now. Let's wait for people to write questions. Um, I will start with the the very first question that my mentor, uh, Francesco Logozzo, asked whenever he's in front of a new static analysis tool is, um, does it scale up? Uh, I haven't seen any feed, any benchmark uh, in your presentation. Um, do you have any? Um, well, I mean, we have examples. They're not um, they're not uh, very big. The ones that we had in the tables in the in the in the results tables. Um, so the, the the main the main thing is um, the resource analysis itself is compositional. So it's not really at least conceptually a problem of having many modules or many many contracts or a large contract. I mean, or many lines of code. Let's say that that is not um, a big concern, right? Um, also, one of the things that we have done uh, recently is um, include the um, the, the resource analysis as an abstract domain inside the traditional fixed point. We had it before at the beginning, we had it separate, you know, like as a post-processing 
after all the analysis, all the sharing, uh, pointer analysis and all that, you know, we would grab all the information on the program and then we would set up the equations and solve them. But now we run all these analysis inside the abstract interpreter as an abstract domain of uh, partial, um, uh, partially defined functions, uh, um, functions defined in segments, let's say. No, and then um, this this abstract domain. The advantage of putting it inside the, the the abstract interpreter is that you inherit a lot of things. Like for example, that it has, knows how to deal with modules and 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 be incremental at the modular level. So if you have analyzed already um, a module, then you don't have to do another one. This could be applied to contracts that call each other and so on. This is this is work in progress. So it's very interesting. Also it has to do with uh, compositionality or or systems of uh, the, the whole system of interacting contracts. No? Um, it also has um, incrementality within a module, so this would be within a contract. That if you change part of a contract only, you don't have to recompute the whole. The, the whole. And this this is why when we say that we want to make the tool um, interactive, um, we made it to be reactive, to be reacted instantly. So so it is a big concern that is that is fast because you want it to be something that reacts almost as you're programming, you know. So where exactly do you see the, the tool being integrated in the development process of a, of a smart contract developer? Okay, so th this is a very, very, very big, a very good question. Um, okay, the first, the first thing is, um, it's now, I have, you know, clearly now we, it's a prototype. What we have is a prototype. It's a prototype that can deal with a lot of contracts. Um, we have to remember what we're dealing with here. We, we're doing abstract interpretation. No. So what are the advantages of abstract interpretation and, and the disadvantages? So uh, compared to what? Compared to testing, let's say, or com you know, trying things on the on the on the on the platform or verification. So we have trade-offs. I mean, so a trade-off, when we use a tool like this, the the advantage is that you can prove things. With testing, you cannot prove things, you can only find errors, right? But here you can prove things and 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 you can say yes, this holds. We can verify this assertion. We can say that we will not violate a certain limit of gas and so on. So we can give uh, guarantees. That's the advantage, and we can do so automatically. So that's the comparison with uh, verification. So the comparison with verification is we can do it automatically, but we cannot do it all because it's impossible to do everything automatically. It's, it's, it's uh, they're undecidable properties. So you you have to work by hand. So that's the niche that we cover. Now, will this work for all programs? So we say a practical tool. It, it, it's a practical tool. It says that it will cover a lot of cases, we, we think, no? And, and, and we hope to do that soon and be able. So in, 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 said in, in, another, in other words, it will hopefully cover the bulk of the work. There will always be some part that you have to do by hand, maybe by verification, because it's too complicated because it's beyond the capabilities of the abstract domains and so on. So this is the nature of the spectrum of testing, abstract interpretation, proof, uh, you know, provers that, 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 that we have and that we're exploring together you know, in, this, in this community. So in my experience, when you put the, the static analysis tools uh, um, as close as to possible to uh, the, the editor, then that's where you find the, the most bugs and where you can fix them. Um, would it be possible with your tool? Is it fast enough? Oh, that, that is exactly what we want. I mean, the, 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 the pro prototype actually works like that. It's integrated for now in, in Emacs. Also, we have also for for VSC, uh, you know, Virtual Studio Code and so on. But the idea is, yes, I mean, it works in the background. And essentially, you're getting, as you program, this is what well, the incrementality uh, comes in, right? And and the speed. You know? So as, as, as you're programming, you're getting the same way you get a uh, let's say a syntax, syntax error or a compiler error, you're getting on the fly over your code the, the cost errors. This, 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 is, this is exactly the way it's, it's supposed to work. As opposed to verification where I think you have to kind of step back a little bit and say, okay, all right, I want to prove this property. So I step back, I start working, I have gaps, I fill in the gaps with my prover. That, that requires a little bit of stepping back. No, but here we're still that's, that's the idea of using abstract interpretation, as you say. It's, it's, we're still, the, the objective is still to be automatic, right? to be within the, the, the editor. Yes, abso absolutely. <laughs> but um, but your, your tool works on Mikkelsen, and people usually don't um, write uh, smart contracts in Mikkelsen. They use Lego, they use SmartPy or other languages. Yes. Um, how, does that, so, how does that connect? You know? Yeah. All right. So 
Very, very good question. So the idea is, of course, you have to you translate from the original language to uh, Mikkelsen, and we analyze the Mikkelsen. Now, we analyze the Mik Mikkelsen in the same way that in traditional language, you analyze the, uh, the assembly code because the resources are there. I mean, it, 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 it's a bit less of, a, of an issue in, uh, in contracts, you know, because you don't want the compiler to do many things, you know. But in general, the compiler could eliminate steps, could see that some things are redundant, etc. So you really want to analyze, to know how much gas you're going to uh, consume, you want to analyze the Mikkelsen code. So that, that, that I think, is a good idea. No? Um, but of course, you, now, because you're translating from the Mikkelsen, so, sorry, from the source code to the Mikkelsen code, then from the Mikkelsen code to the internal representation and so on, we already reflect back on the Mikkelsen code the um, uh, the, the errors that we get on the internal representation. So there's another step. So you would ref refer back to the original code, to the source code, um, the, the the errors. And uh, actually, there are techniques for that that we use and that, that are there in the tool, which is essentially keeping track of the line numbers, and those are pushed down or other markers. And then you can reflect the the give the all the uh, errors or you know or advice or information in terms of the line numbers of the original program before the translation into, into Mikkelson. That makes sense. Mm. Yeah, and hopefully we'll have people working on that. I don't know if, if you are, or if we should ask our friends on uh, other languages to, to help you on that. So we, we have the mechanics, but we need that when, when there is a translation into Mikkelson that, that you can preserve the line numbers or you can preserve uh, information on the source so that we can pick it up. That, that's, that's what's needed. Um, I've seen a question popping up uh, in the comment. Uh, so Herman is asking, what aspects of Mikkelsen semantics make it more amenable for static analysis than other smart contract frameworks? Well, f first, I mean, the, the fact that there are functions, the fact that there's no side effects, uh, the fact that um, um, it's, it's much simpler that you have types. You know, the types help a lot because we don't have to infer in, 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 infer the, the, the types. So being strongly typed simplifies things. Um, the, the structure is uh, simple. There are some things that actually complicate it a little bit, like the stack is a bit of a pain. But there are standard techniques for undoing the, <laughs> the stack and turning it back. That's what we do, right? I, I, I think I explained that a little bit, that, that, that you turn things back into um, arguments <laughs> and pass it through arguments. That's much easier for the analyzer to, to understand that things that are buried, buried in a stack. Um, but all in all, it's there's a lot of sim simplifications. Um, that there's oh, another thing that's a bit complicated. I mentioned it at the end is uh, the, the maps and so on. But you know, we, we think we know how to deal with that also, you know, by passing as part of the description of what you're passing, passing also the the cost function for that, for what you're passing mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as an extended type, you know, if you want a dependent type or how you, where you want to call it, or liquid type. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's the, yeah. that's the answer. So if, if there was anything you could change on the language to, to help you do the analysis, uh, what would it be? Mm, that's a hard one. <laughs> Because we can change the language. Yeah, no, I understand. I, understand. I, I, yeah, I haven't thought. Um, I haven't thought much about that. I mean, I, th I think it's, uh, it's pretty reasonable as it is. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, obviously, you're changing it from a, a stack-based language to a variable yeah, based. Yeah, that, that's the one thing as I mentioned. Uh, yeah. That would simplify a little bit. And no higher order and. Then, oh, if you take out the higher order, of course, that simplifies a lot. Yeah, but then <laughs> you lose a lot. I mean, all the, the things that I mentioned as complications, if you take them out, of course, it makes our life much simpler. Yep. Okay. Uh, Vincent is asking, do you have the chance to check uh, your analysis against mainnet smart contracts call that resulted in gas exhaustion to verify your results? Okay, so no, the answer, the answer, is, uh, the answer is no. We, we have it. I mean, we've got we've um, we have checked it against um, real contracts, um, but we have not um, looked at actual contracts that run out of gas. That would be super interesting. And thanks, thanks for the pointers. Yes, this is a very nice thing to to um, to add this. 
Yes. Yes. So Vincent, we're counting on you to to. And you're also them. saying the oh, so the full pickles on semantics. I think we pretty much uh, support the full pickles on semantics, requiring sometimes some assertions, like I show for for the um, uh, for, for the higher order. Know that we need some annotations because otherwise we cannot invent what the thing we're going to call will consume. So that you you need you need to help there or. In a compositional analysis, we have to trans, trans, transmit it from one contract to another, or yeah. you know, Obviously. yeah. But by the way, by the way, that one thing, and we maybe you and I have this, uh, discussed this, and uh, 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 also uh, Jose and, and and Pedro and Victor, um, if a, a, an assertion language, some kind of assertion language um, at the Nicholson level might be useful, and we've you know we've been giving some thought to that. You know, and of course, at the higher levels, you know, the assertion language is what allows you to th things that we could add, no, that, that allows you to to translate this so that the specifications could also be translated to a common representation. This is this is maybe the point that it, that it makes sense at the Mikkelson level. No? So, so you're sure that the translation of the specification from the source to the Mikkelson level has not lost information because at the source level, you're not really sure what exact concept or type and so on of the Mikkelson part that you're you're talking about no? you may may not be yeah we we have other projects working on on other analysis for Mikkelson and I think they, they also want an assertion language so maybe we right. should organize a, a workshop to to discuss this point that, that would be great like I said that would be a, a great uh, topic for collaboration between the different projects yes. Uh, so Vincent was uh, asking if you support the, the full uh, semantics of Mikkelsen. I was worried. Do you support pack and unpack? Do, do I we support? Sorry, uh, pack and unpack. Pack and unpack. Do we support pack and unpack? I'm not it's, sure. Uh, I have to serialization and serialization. That, that would be. I I I I know. Okay. I think we would all have too much trouble. I don't know if I were doing it. I have to say that I'm not. I'm not sure we, whether we have that um, implemented right now. I mean, Victor will have to answer to answer that one if he wants to. Victor, if you want to answer on the on the chat, if you're there, because um, he did the encoding of, of a lot of the instructions. You no, know, so I'm not sure if that one he did also or not. Um, the but I don't think it would be so hard. And I, let me explain why. Because when you pack or unpack, basically you're translating a data structure into a, a serial, into a representation, right? Now, remember that we do have the sizes of data structures. So if we have a list, we know the length of the list and maybe the size of the elements. That, that connects with the size type. So a size type is a complex type that has not only the type, but also the size of the elements of the type. So a, a size type allows us to say, this is a list whose length is between this lower bound and that upper bound, and whose elements are between these bounds. So with that information, you can bound the so you, you have the size of the elements and the size of the list, and that works recursively. So you can have lists of lists, and, but you have the bounds. So you can multiply them, and you can infer the size of the of of, of this of the of, of the string that you produce in the serialization. So so I think that can, if, I don't know if we have it. Uh, like I said, I, I want to uh, commit to saying that we have encoded it, but I, I I I'm pretty confident that we can do it. Yes. So that's what you meant by size type uh, value yes. uh, analysis. Okay. Yes. So that exactly. Looks like uh, dependent types where the dependencies on the the size. But I, I exactly. suppose that if you support the size, you could support other things, and right. there's many notions of size. Exactly. And, but how? Which one do you choose? Do you have to encode them? To, to so remember, this them? this is uh, this is outside interpretation. So it's fixed. I mean, we we have domains. You can. You can write a different domain, but we, if you when we say size types, this is a, a domain, and this is a domain that has basically your your basic types annotated with upper and lower bounds. You could have another type set of types, another domain that tracks uh, sizes with upper, lower, and average bound, or 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 accumulated cost uh, uh, size. Or you could have other things, but here it's, it's like a second interpretation is recipes. You have a recipe which is size types, and then and that's why it can be. It, that's why it's automatic, right? So, so when I say that, I said I mean exactly that. Can you write other domains that do other things with the with the types and keep other sizes? Yes, you can because they're plugins. The domains are plugins. They just just write a new domain. And could you add them? I would say more or less dynamically um, in in a in an assertion language. 
Do you have? A... Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a uh, yes, yes. You can with, with these assertions, you can basically um, express for for all the language elements. You basically you, you can write the transfer functions, right? So you, for every language element, you can say if I get this, then I return that. If I get this and like that, you can write. It's, it's like uh, um, production rules or or natural language. Uh, no, sorry, natural no, natural deduction rules, etc. I mean, it's the same thing always. No, you you, you can describe the the, the individual um, operations of the language. That's very cool. I see that Victor uh, answered on pack and unpack. So uh, you have a dummy implementation of pack and pack by now returning the past parameter in a product structure. Uh -huh. Something that's like because that's Victor. So uh, yeah. So the answer is yes. Then we, we yeah. do have pack and unpack. So I, I, I couldn't remember. So I, thanks. So you don't you don't convert to bytes, but you 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 do wrap the the expression. If that makes exactly. sense. Uh, okay. We we do have another question from uh, Lakram Yara. Says thank thank you for your talk. You have mentioned that one of the next steps is to connect with verification. What is involved? In the verification of resource properties, what needs to be added to your system to achieve that? Ah, okay. Thank you for, for the question. So the system uh, actually there. I think I can probably, uh, if we have time, do we still have time? Uh, okay. Yeah, we do have time. Okay. So let me just let me let me show a slide um, here that I did not have time to put in the. Um, okay, this I think this one will work. Um, this is the, the schematic, I mean, of how, what, what we do. Um, so basically the static analysis produces analysis info, which is safe approximations. And basically we compare that to the assertions, to the, to the, to the assertions. And that, that way we check whether the assertions are, are true, false, etc. Now, what does this entail when we are in, um, here, so when we are dealing with resources? Now, the interesting thing is that in resources, the the abstract information what we infer and what we specify is functions because it's always a function sorry for of the of, of the of the size of the input so when we the, the the specification here in blue basically gives us two curves an upper bound curve and a lower bound curve which is you know what within what band you know we want our our um our consumption to be so so our gas consumption for sorry for I, I forgot to say the x-axis is the input data size so as we have larger and larger data we want our gas consumption to be in this band with it within these limits right so our specification is by nature curves you know so it's a band mm -hmm. between two curves and then what the analysis infers which I put here in green which is true you know green for true for safe you know says that our inferred information is within this band this band and um now the intersection of these two bands so basically it's about crossing functions you know the verification problem turns into a, 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 a function comparison uh problem and that gives us regions which could be a here here gives us i could give you any number of regions of course depending on how complex the, the functions are so here where, where we have that our consumption is always above always anything that is um, inferred by the analysis above the band admitted in the in the specification of course is incorrect and here when it's below is also incorrect assuming we're, we're we're giving a lower bound which may we may or may not want to give then we have this part here which is really interesting which is where we we know that all our actual gas consumptions are inside the specification so this is where we can turn up an assertion into correct into true into checked and then, because it's abstract interpretation, and we're always doing safe, we're doing upper bounds, lower bounds, and so on. Well, we may have parts where you see we we don't know. We know that our real values are inside this, but some of those real values might be inside, some may be outside. And then, of course, there we we say we have to say don't, I don't know. So that that's if we go back to this example that I used in the in the talk for my pragma which was say i want the energy to be less than 416 here the specification is just a straight line it's very simple no so we ended up with some in inference which is two lines no these are two lines that are crossed by by the specification line which these are two straight lines in this case but what is upper bound remember it's because of the if the else is here that we get uh, a, a band 
And then that is why we get that from 1 to 120 elements, we verify, and from 121 elements on, we are false. We are we're in we're in one of one of these regions here. Okay, so I think so that, you're saying that, that you can infer uh, conditions on the input size. Exactly, exactly. So we can even infer conditions backwards. In, in, yes, yes, exactly. Very good point, Mehdi. <laughs> infer conditions on the on the input sizes. Yes, exactly. I hope that answers the, the question of what, what's implied in verification. So that's that's the next thing we want to plug. But we, we need the assertion language, right? Because we have to specify what we want. Indeed. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that looks great. Um, we work on the, on the specification language. Yep. Um, Pierre Emmanuel is asking, so thank you for your talk. If you want to prove, isn't the size of the trusted computing base a concern? Can the fixed point found be verified? Yes, very good question. Excellent question. It's the same as with proof techniques. Um, you don't have to prove the abstract interpreter, which is very complex and, and every you don't have to prove it correct. The only thing you have to prove correct is the the reasoning, the proof. Now, abstract interpreters generate proofs just the same. Basically, I mean, just to get an idea, you, you have a bunch of instructions. Each instruction, you have a transfer function. The verification problem there is exactly the same as in any proof method. No, you basically tra transfer the information and so on. The only difference is when you have a loop. When you have a loop, in abstract interpretation, the invariant, normally you have to state the invariant and then prove it. No, What abstract interpretation does is it infers the invariant by iterating from the bottom up in a lattice until you get the invariant. Now, once you get the invariant, which is the hard thing, and you don't want to prove that code correct because it has acceleration and dependency tracking and it's super complicated. But once you have the invariant, then going over the proof that you generated with the abstract interpreter is exactly the same as proving, like saying in, in proof carrying code, etc. It's, it's like or having a checker. No, so you just need a checker. So the answer is the same as with a traditional proof system with a checker that is very simple or relatively simple. So you have to trust, basically. The transfer functions, if you get the transfer functions wrong, then it doesn't work. But I'll, I'll say more about that in a second. And the checker. Now, the checker can be super simple. It's just applying the transfer functions one after another. When you get to the to the to the loops, you know, you use the invariant, which has been inferred already, and you check that when you get to the end of the loop, the invariant is the same, and you're done. And always the checking is always one pass. We have a nice paper on abstraction carrying code. That all these uh, worked out. And um, what did I say? Oh, uh, yes. And then the individual um, the individual functions. Those you have to either check by yourself with with respect. I mean, whether they're correct with respect to the definition of the semantics of the language, and that is where the the partial evaluation works. You know, if you believe that the interpreter is doing what the language does, but remember, the language is defined with an interpreter more or less. No, so so it's, so it's I mean, it's easy to convince yourself that the interpreter is doing it. Then it's just a partial evaluation. Um, you have to trust the partial evaluator. That, that, that you have to do, yes. We do also have a, a specification of Mikkelsen in the K language. So um, I don't know whether, um, I, I don't even know whether, whether the, the interpreter is, uh, is OK with the specification in, the, in this language. But um, um, you, you don't have to trust the, the interpreter. You can use the, another specification and, and check. Um, Right. So, but but does you uh, the transfer function from the abstract domain produce um, steps for for another checker to reproduce? To say it again, maybe. So the the the, um, the, the transfer so, functions basically are are these assertions that that I wrote. Basically, it says if you are in this point and you go to the next point, then I mean, if you go over some um, or execute yeah. some instruction, then the cost the gas cost will be this much more that you get directly from the model. I mean, from the, from the protocol, right? And and then what happens to the storage, to the stack from one to the other, you, you get directly. I mean, so so the transfer functions are, are relatively simple. Well, you have a lot of transfer functions in, in a lot of uh, abstract domain, if I understood correctly. Right. Right. But they, they don't generate uh, proof fragments. Right. Yes, they do. I mean, oh, if, if you think about it, what you end up... Yeah, okay, so maybe I didn't explain that well. Uh, um, so I, I didn't show that. But if 
you have the original program, what you end up with is not just the input output, as I showed, you get every every step in the program, you get it annotated. It's like if you have a whore, uh, whore triple proof, you know, so you have your whore triples at the beginning of the end, but also each step, you see you see the steps. So that's what you have to check. You have to check. So 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 in the end, what you produce is a proof. I see. As associated with, with, with a statement, associated with each step in the program, each... each uh, This, this, this is what I mentioned about the proof carrying, uh, abstraction carrying code. So that 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 we, that we yeah. have the machinery to generate these these proofs, you know, so you can check them at the other end. And is the the, the proof checker? Uh, do, do you have any bound on the complexity of the proof checker? Because we we thought that's about really using... that's very good. The, the the proof checker is linear. It's linear in the size of the program. Okay. Um. So we we could. Uh, we could remove the, the gas consumption uh, mechanism in the protocol and, and use uh, your mechanism instead. If if we are certain that the, the proof checking is small enough. No, this That's whole idea of having, uh, you know, um, proof carrying code, you know, with, 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 with uh, these properties associated with the code, yeah, it's, a, it's a very good idea. Yes, I mean, we could work on that, yes. We, we should try that. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's definitely not sure that uh, it will be faster. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick has a question. Are there constructs or cases where the inferred functions are not precise enough or not at all precise? Yes. Yes, yes, they are. Because it's an undecidable property, yes. Yeah. So, yes. Um, can, can I characterize them? No, and that's also very profound. It's very difficult in general. I mean, for particular programs, for particular properties, for particular domains, maybe you have a chance to characterize a bit. And anyway, in, anytime you see one that is very imprecise, you just improve the, the domain. Then, the, yes, and also you can add very, 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 very good point. So you, you can also add an assertion. For example, let's say you have a, a segment of code or a call to, 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 to a contract or something where the analysis is imprecise. You can add an assertion, a trust assertion, which is trust that that this is the, the cost. Of course, you have just introduced an assumes. I mean, it's an assumes, no? So you have just introduced an assumption. So you have to prove it by yourself on the side with a piece of paper in your head without, with third you, 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 you have to do it somehow, but you will not get stuck. And this is what I mean that it will get the bulk of the of the of the. So it's a very very nice question, very very uh, appropriate. You you can get rid of the bulk of the work, but you will have spots here and there where it loses precision, and those are where you go in by hand and say, okay, you get lost here. I give you an assertion. I say here, the the the, the cost after this is this, or this is the cost function for this operation that you can you haven't been able to figure out, and then it doesn't get stuck. It continues. So you have to work a little bit here and there, you know, filling in. Well, abstract interpretation never gets stuck anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we never um, get stuck, but it can get imprecise. We can get imprecise. Yes. No, no. Sorry, you're right. It doesn't, you're right. It doesn't get stuck. It, it, it just maybe goes to top, you know, which doesn't yeah. help very much. No? Yeah. Um, Emilio is asking Manuel to check the proofs you need a data log engine. You could do it with a data log engine. Yes. Yes. Very good point. Yes. Pretty much, uh, the RSAC interpretation is essentially, you, you could see it as a data log engine, except, uh, yes, if you think of all the arguments grounded and so on, yes, you could, you could see it as a data log engine, um, but with the magic set transformations and so on, because it does a top-down top down, um, pass. So, so it's basically, what it really is, is it's, an, it, it, it's a resolution engine with tabling, that um, works on the abstract domain instead of on the concrete domain. Instead of the Herbert domain, it works on an abstract domain. And that can be also implemented with a, with a data log engine. So that the checker you can do with a data log engine. And, and then, as you say, um, if the data log engine, which is they're typically uh, simple, is, has already been proof correct, then yes, you, you have a, a proof correct checker. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I have questions on my own. Um, you, you mentioned inferring uh, the size and the shape of the list of operations. Does it mean that we can infer the, the whole gas consumed by contract call itself, 
calling other contracts. So I remember that at the beginning you you could infer that the gas is consumed by one contract uh, until it, it returns, but can you also uh, infer the whole gas with the different calls? Okay, so we, I, we cannot do that yet, but that's the plan. I mean, in the sense that, yes, if exactly. So we, the next step, I mean, we actually have it, you know, something already almost working, you know, that, that, um, that infers the list of operations. And then if you feed that to the contracts and you iterate over the contracts, then maybe you can get results for a set of contracts. I see. Yep. Um, we do have uh, other people working on static analysis of, of Mikkelsen, but I know you, you have a lot of uh, advanced uh, domains um, integrated in, in your your tool. Can they be reused in other tools? Or? Uh, yes, I think I think they, they, they can be. I mean, in the sense that, um, I mean, and we use domains from other people also. We, we use uh, domains from PPL, for example, from the um, Parma library and from uh, El Elina, for example, you know, the you know, for the yeah. polyethra and so on. So yes, I think we can all use each other's uh, domains. Our, ours are um, they're written either in C or in Prolog, but uh, well, in Chao, I mean, in the Chao version of Prolog. Um, but the, the, you can call perfectly the, the code of the domain, and you know, the abstract domains are abstract domains, right? I mean, you know, if you have, for example, a representation for aliasing, which is let's say pairs, pairs of variables with the alias or not, or sets of variables and so on, but there's just a, a list of pairs, no? So you get the list of pairs and the operation. So yes, I mean they, they could be presumably they, they could some of them could be reused. And certainly the, the the cost now I'm thinking about your question. I mean the like the solver could be reused. I mean there's there's things that can be redu reused, yes. I'm thinking about uh, security and authentication analysis that I think you're not doing at all. So um mm -hmm. but if I can start from a from value analysis that's precise enough then that that's a lot uh, easier. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so as a, a protocol developer, I would, I would love to have the same tool for our own source code because, uh, you know, it's, it's not always uh, easy to know where the resources are consumed. I think it would help a lot the, the, the Tezos core developers, um, both the shell and the protocol, uh, to understand whether the resources are, are consumed either time, memory, uh, um, disk accesses, network uh, usage. So how far are you from having the, the same tool for OCaml? Right, so we will have to, yeah, I mean that, that for, for doing that, we will have to have the tool work on OCaml. We have actually analyzed um, ML, in general ML programs uh, before, um, not a lot. I mean, it was basically to compare to other tools um, that that uh, work on on, on ML or NoCaml or other uh, flavors, um, and uh, and we know we can we can do it. Uh, we don't have all the infrastructure, so this this would be something for for the translation and so on. Because we have to do the translation to the to the internal representation and so on. I mean, it's it's doable. It's a, it's a bit um, sort of a different thing you know, that we would have to get into and we have interest in, in getting into that I mean, and, and we believe it's it's doable yes that, that, and that would be a great a great thing to tackle yeah. how, how uh, hard is it to handle the higher order and, uh, and functional values right I, again I mean the, the thing with higher order is that um, you you have to have as, as you do that you have the types of the function that you're passing but you have to have also the cost of the function that you're passing you have to elevate the, your, your your so that your domain can track of what i'm passing here is a function that goes to you know lift it one 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 level um and um that that's something that seems in, in any case is necessary for um for uh for mickelson any anyway um uh, and so we have some support for that and we've done you know we have a higher order assertion language and so on but uh, but it's something that we can that we definitely want to work on i mean and we are we are working on it i i, I actually put it in, in the list right that you know improve the support of uh, higher order so that that there's some work to be done there still and we definitely want to advance and that would be an enabler for attacking this uh, ambitious goal let's say of an of um 
analyzing the protocol code to be super interesting. Yeah. And if I had the, this tool working on the protocol code, could I use it to check that the gas is correctly consumed? I guess so, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, that, that, I mean that the, the gas model represents another approximation of the, the real usage uh, of the CPU. That's a good question. Um, I mean, it will definitely tell you how many times you call this function or that function and so on, that, those sorts of things. Um, um, I have to think about that. I mean, so whether you can check that the that the um, code is checking is co calculating the cost correctly with respect to us a, a specification because up to now the specification of the cost of the gas uh, of the consumption was the code. So 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 I, I can answer that question immediately. Yes, the code is calculating the gas consumption precisely because it's the definition of, <laughs> of the gas consumption, right? But um, um, you know, if you have a separate definition of the gas consumption, I mean, as, as we have now, and the, and the, and then the code, that's an interesting one. And speaking of the gas model, uh, I think now you you extract it from the from our code, and um, but we are, we're hiring and more and more developers, and the, the code is changing faster and faster. So there's another scale. That's interesting. Is how fast can you um, get up to speed and, get, uh, and um, update your your model to to match ours? All right, so we can do that relatively fast if we have um, a good specification. So as as we have changed the uh, protocols, we've been able to follow because um, uh, defining if if you have a clear idea of what the cost is. Then translate it into assertions is not hard. I mean, it's, it's relatively fast. I mean, it's a day to day, two days work. But um, now the, qu the question is how easy it is to uh, find out what the, the, the cost model is, you know, the gas model. So if, if you have to extract it from the code, if the code gets more and more complicated, then it's more and more complicated. Of course, you could, um, let's say, dream of, of uh, doing it automatically, but for that, you would need to have a slicer or something like that for Ocano. No? So that, that that, that's what you would want, no? Um, the at, least, at least I suppose we could help in uh, in writing um, more um, formal specification um, or, or writing our, our OCaml code in, in a way that you can extract more easily the, the that, that, yes. Maybe like, you know, writing macros and generating the, the OCaml code from the specification, things, things like that could be a good idea, right? Yeah, that'd be the ideal. Yep. Yeah, so that's uh, that's a message for Luca. Um, <laughs> we have uh, no more questions. Um, um, so thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for for your talk. Uh, I hope uh, the audience uh, liked it uh, as much as I did. And thank you uh, for everybody who attended the, this research seminar session. And uh, goodbye. Thank you very much, Maria. Thanks for thanks for inviting us and. Uh... We really, really enjoyed it also. Goodbye. Bye.